What is HelloFresh? With HelloFresh, you get farm fresh, pre-portioned ingredients, and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip the trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. Fall is right around the corner, and HelloFresh is there to help you plan for the busy season ahead with tasty dishes delivered right to your door. You just simply choose recipes and pick your delivery date, then lay back and enjoy the last days of summer, knowing that dinner is covered. Parents have enough back-to-school shopping and planning to do. Let HelloFresh get the groceries and save you some cash with pre-portioned meals, again, delivered right to your door. So when life gets busy, don't call for delivery. Go with HelloFresh. I've been using HelloFresh for a while now, and I cannot tell you how much simpler making dinner has become. It really does give me one less thing to worry about. So go to HelloFresh.com slash 50 who killed and use code 50 who killed for 50% off plus free shipping. Again, go to HelloFresh.com slash 50 who killed and use code 50 who killed for 50% off plus free shipping. Slow Burn Media and Evergreen Podcast presents Who Killed, a podcast that provides a voice for the voiceless. Rebecca Andowski and Kathleen Thomas, two haunting names never forgotten by people at Hampton Roads. They're the first two victims of the Colonial Parkway murders. Three days later on Sunday evening, that car, a Honda Civic, was found off the Colonial Parkway. It had been rolled into these bushes, almost into the water. I won't ever stop. This is very important to me and to my family. Typically what the FBI will do is the investigative uh, agent will will text me and say can you please call me and I'll know they have some news and we're talking a lot these days and I'm thrilled about that me and one of the other detectives found David about 50 feet down I guess she had a beautiful smile and a loving way he doesn't leave his truck unlocked Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Who Killed Amy Mahalovic, a podcast that takes a deep dive into cases you may not have heard of and others you may have. I am your host, Bill Huffman, and this week's case is one any true crime fan or news junkie is familiar with, and that is the Colonial Parkway Murders. Instead of my usual show where I tell the story, I'm going to start off with some facts about the area and the case, and then I'm going to let someone who knows way more about the situation to show my listeners the way. So this week I am joined by Bill Thomas, the brother of Kathy Thomas, one of the first victims in the Colonial Parkway murders. Bill is remarkably candid about the experience of being the brother of a victim and the fight he has had to endure to get the resources necessary to solve his sister's case. The Colonial Parkway murders were a string of serial killings that occurred in just a three-year span from 1986 to 1989 and remains unsolved to this day. This is a case with many ups and downs, suspects galore, and coincidences that just cannot be explained. So join me this week for part one of the Colonial Parkway murders. Before we get too deep into this subject matter of the Colonial Parkway murders, I thought it would be important to give you just a few facts about the parkway itself. If you have never had the pleasure of driving it or experience it on a class trip, it's definitely one that you should definitely check out. The Colonial Parkway is a 23-mile scenic roadway that stretches from the York River at Yorktown to the James River at Jamestown. The road does its best to remind drivers of the days past as the parkway does not allow semi-trucks and is toll-free. 
As you meander through the parkway, you are graced with beautiful views of the James and York rivers that run along the parkway. According to AAA, quote, red buds and dogwoods decorate the roadway in the spring, while fall brings an explosion of autumn colors. When the sun is out on the parkway, it is a destination for hikers and day trippers. But when the sun goes down and the park officially closes, is when the modern accoutrements such as lights and gas stations are most sorely missed. From an article in the Daily Press in 1990, the parkway is no place to be after dark. Quote, at night the mood changes. The trees form a tunnel of blackness, broken only if the moon is shining. There are no street lights, no call boxes, and no fast food restaurants or convenience stores where a driver might find refuge in case of a breakdown. Unquote. The parkway is under the ranger's jurisdiction because it is federal land owned by the National Park Service. So when a serious crime is committed, the York County Sheriff Department, the Williamsburg or James City Police Departments are called in to assist, and sometimes the FBI is also called in to consult in investigations. CrimeMuseum.org says, quote, Police have questioned 150 suspects in connection to these four cases, but all have been cleared. The police attribute these eight murders to the same killer because of the similarities in each case. All the victims were killed at or near their car, the first three being found at the known lover's lane areas. None of the victims were robbed, and sexual assault did not appear to be a motive in any of the cases. The first and third murders were mere miles apart, and the second and fourth were committed about a half hour away from the parkway. In 2018, the Facebook page Colonial Parkway Murders, which is run by Kathy's brother, Bill Thomas, and today's guest, revealed that DNA had been found at three of the four crime scenes, which could potentially conclusively link the cases and lead to an arrest. Hair that had been found in Kathy's hand and a biological sample found on Robin have never been tested. The first couple to fall victim was Kathy Thomas and Rebecca Dowski. And Kathleen Thomas, 27, was a class of 1981 graduate of the United States Naval, Naval Academy, and Rebecca Dowski was a senior at the College of William and Mary. And on October 12, 1986, on Columbus Day weekend, their bodies were found inside Thomas's white 1980 Honda Civic near the Annex Overlook. And this is where I will let Bill Thomas jump in and take away the story because he is the one that understands the case the best and he is the one that has been pressuring the FBI for resources and help in testing the untested samples and he is hoping that public exposure such as podcasts and television shows like the one that he's doing with Oxygen will help keep the case and get the case the resources it needs to be solved so let's just hop in with my conversation with bill uh, i'm joined today with uh, bill thomas who has a real serious connection to the colonial parkway murders and i would like to introduce my guest and uh bill the floor is yours oh well thank you well thank you bill and this will be confusing because we have two bills on the uh, on the show today. Um, thank you. So you wanted me to tell everybody who I was, and I guess I should. Uh, I'm Bill Thomas. I'm the older brother of Kathy Thomas, who together with her girlfriend, Rebecca Dowski, were the first two victims in the so-called Colonial Parkway murders in Virginia. And the Colonial Parkway murders are a series of eight murders, four young couples who were killed in Lover's Lane in and around Williamsburg, Virginia from 1986 to 1989. You have approximately one couple a year for, it's actually three years on a calendar, but it's 1986 to 1989, um, were killed. And two of the cases are FBI cases and two of the cases are Virginia State Police cases. We can get into why in a minute. Um, but the cases remain unsolved to date. So how old were you when your sister became a victim of the Colonial Parkway? 
I was about a month shy of my 30th birthday. So that would have been um, October 1986. And were you living in the area when that occurred or were you, where were you living at the time? I was living in Philadelphia. I was working as a marketing manager for RCA Video and um, in, in southern New Jersey. And I was living um, in a really cool third floor walk up um, in, in Philadelphia, a couple blocks south of South Street um, in South Philadelphia. And as far as like when the, <clears throat> when the crime occurred, did you know that your sister had been missing at that time? Or was that something that wasn't known? Because it didn't, it took a few That's days. Something that, that, correct. It wasn't something that was known. We had heard, I, I received a phone call from my parents on a Sunday afternoon. I was at my apartment uh, in, in Philadelphia. And of course, for your listeners, we're, we're going back 30 to almost 33 years. This is pre-cell phone, pre-internet. So if you wanted to reach somebody, you either call them on a landline at home or a landline at work. That was pretty much it. So the phone rang. It was my parents calling from Lowell, Massachusetts, up north of Boston. It was both my mother and my father. It wasn't unusual to hear from my folks, you know, close Irish Catholic family, Kennedy Democrats from Boston, four kids, two of them in the Navy, my older brother, Richard, and my younger sister, Kathy. Um, so we talked frequently, but one of the things I noticed when the phone rang and it was both my mom and dad, which was a little unusual, but my dad's tone was so serious and he did most of the talking. My mom was kind of quiet in general. And, my, you know, I remember the, one of the first things he said was, are you sitting down? And I remember thinking, what a weird thing to ask. What do you mean? Am I sitting down? What do I need to sit down for? And he told me um, that my sister Kathy, um, her body had been discovered in her 1980 Honda Civic, along with her then new girlfriend, a young woman named Rebecca Dowski. Um, th their bodies had been found in Kathy's car in a, in a place called the Colonial Parkway, uh, which is near Williamsburg, Virginia. And Kathy had been living... Um, in Norfolk and then had recently moved to Virginia beach and, um, uh, had been dating Rebecca for about six months, I would say. And Rebecca was a student at William and Mary. And so this would have been in that, in that same area kind of near Williamsburg in this beautiful 23 mile long stretch of the colonial parkway, uh, along the James and York rivers. Um, if your listeners have ever been down to any of those historic sites, you know, Jamestown, Yorktown, Colonial Williamsburg, Absolutely. the Colonial Parkway is this federal, it's a federal highway designed to look like an old fashioned highway and connects those historic sites and, and runs along uh, the river. It was built in the forties, I want to say, but it's designed to look like a highway from before the federal highway system was built. Yeah, I mean, I've, I I remember going on the Colonial Parkway when I was younger during class trips uh, to Williamsburg, and right. I do remember it being just beautiful. And you're right, it did have that old school uh, look to it. Yeah, it's and and to answer your question directly, I'm sorry, one thing I missed: um, Kathy and Becky had gone missing on a Thursday night, and this was Sunday, so about two and a half days had gone by from the time they were last till the time the bodies were found. But we were not aware of the fact that, that Kathy and Becky were missing. There was some confusion amongst a group of friends as to whether perhaps Kathy and Becky had hopped in Kathy's Honda, which they loved to do, and headed off like to Washington, D.C. or Annapolis or some other place. And so, and again, you know, this is a pre-internet, pre-cell phone environment. So, like I said, you you couldn't track somebody quite as easily as you can now. I mean, everything was just, you know, landlines, so you weren't really able to communicate. You basically leave a, at that time, even, a, I don't know, answering machine message and hope that somebody yeah. gets back to you. But if they're out and about, I guess you don't really ever give it a thought because that just wasn't the case at the time. Now, yeah. it, as far as... Um, 
like you said that they were dating. Was it known? Did you know her? Did you know that Kathy's girlfriend? At the time of their deaths, we had not met Becky. We knew that Kathy was gay. Okay. She had come out to my parents a couple, a couple of years before. And um, she had been dating Becky. Becky would have been her second, Kathy's second relationship with a woman. She was, uh, she was also involved with a shipmate from uh, her ship. Kathy had been in the United States Navy as a, as a naval officer. We, and we should get into that in a second. Okay. But they had started dating the previous spring. So Kathy and Becky were a relatively new couple. We'd heard all kinds of great things about Rebecca Dowski. And we were supposed to meet Becky that Thanksgiving at our parents' house up in Massachusetts. But of course, you know, they died in October, so that never happened. But, you know, at that time, you know, we would talk to Kathy on the phone and, uh, uh, you know, postcards and letters. I mean, it all sounds like we're talking about the 1800s instead of the 1980s, but that's how you communicated, folks. And, um, so we were very excited to meet Becky, but that unfortunately never happened. Now, as far as, you know, when they found, found the bodies, did the, did the authorities have any explanation? Did they, did they give you any idea of what they thought might've been a motive for the case or did they just straight up say, we don't know what's going on here? Well, they said from the very, very beginning, and it's funny how over 30 to going on 33 years, urban legends will develop over time. Uh, and I can disabuse folks of uh, uh, one notion, which is the FBI came and met with my parents a few days later, and my, my younger brother Jack and, and I were also there at the meeting. My older brother Richard had flown from Hawaii to Virginia to identify Kathy's body. So he wasn't with us at this meeting with the FBI, but the FBI said right from the beginning of the case, we believe your sister and Ms. Dowski were approached by an authority figure. Now you have to sort of picture this at my parents' house up in Lowell, Massachusetts, beautiful old house. They're sitting around the dining room table with us. And now remember, I'm a grown man. I'm almost 30 years old, so I'm not a kid. I remember saying, I'm sorry, we, we don't understand. What do you mean by authority figure? And I found it fascinating. The two FBI agents from the Boston office kind of hesitated. And now I've gotten to know the FBI agents pretty well since. And they're usually pretty polished. And they usually have kind of a, you know, an answer at the ready. But I could tell they were uncomfortable with the answer. So they kind of hemmed and hawed for a second, and I was very struck by that. And then they sort of kicked it back in gear, and they said, well, by authority figure, we mean – and then they rattled off a list of like a dozen different agencies, law enforcement agencies. They meant that they thought that Kathy and Becky had been parking at this beautiful pull-off along the Colonial Parkway overlooking the river, and that they'd been approached by an authority figure, and that would be someone in law enforcement or presenting as such. That was an expression they used. So it could be someone in law enforcement or an imposter, a, a, a wannabe, a, you know, a, a, a fake cop. And they mentioned all these different agencies because down in that Norfolk, Williamsburg area, as you know, there are a ton of military bases. And so all of the military operations there have their own security forces. And then you've got local, you know, that is city, county, state, and federal law enforcement all over the place. As a matter of fact, the CIA has its own training facility just a couple of miles along the Colonial Parkway, a place called Camp Perry. And so there's all of this uh, government uh, security and law enforcement uh, presence there. And a lot of them use the Colonial Parkway as a cut through um, because there are no traffic lights and no intersections. It's 23 miles straight. And if you're a cop, you can really you know, fly if you choose to along this curvy road and avoid traffic on I-64, which is a major uh, highway which parallels the Colonial Parkway. So they indicated right from the beginning, they thought that Kathy and Becky were parked and were approached by someone that they found at least initially to be non-threatening. And the FBI believed, and this is within the first few days, that there was a possibility 
that uh, this was someone in law enforcement. And this was the first of sure. the of the murders that occurred on the Colonial Parkway, isn't that correct? That's correct. And, and by the way, I want to be clear about something. They did look at lots of other types of suspects. They looked at Rebecca Dowski's previous college boyfriend. They looked at men that uh, my sister Kathy had dated when she was at the Naval Academy. They looked at shipmates. My sister Kathy was in the second class of women at the United States Naval Academy. So this is all brand new. She was in the class of 1981 at the Academy. So uh, women attending the service academies was new and women obviously graduating and entering the the fleet, as they call it, was new. So they looked at the when Kathy was aboard this ship, the USS L.Y. Spear, which was a submarine tender. She had 200 uh, mostly men uh, reporting to her. Now, so they they took a look to see if there were any, you know, inappropriate uh, uh, interactions with uh, people from the Navy, and they looked at you know, sex offenders and peeping toms and people that they'd had trouble with on the Colonial Parkway. The Colonial Parkway, as we talked about, is this, you know, beautiful, but kind of lonesome stretch of road. And a lot of couples use it as a place to go parking because there are no traffic lights. There's not a single um, uh, overhead. It's really dark out there. It's beautiful and kind of pastoral and green in the in the daytime but at night it really gets dark and kind of spooky so it's a place that people were known to go and and um, uh, get romantic or party or what have you and so things that the FBI looked at were you know who have we ever had trouble with on the parkway so they they try to they looked at a lot of different things people where there was a personal connection as well as people that might have had, um, uh, you know, historical problems on the parkway. Um, so uh, I mentioned law enforcement because it's definitely part of the mix, but it's, it was far from the only theory that the FBI developed. When you're getting pretty much told by the authorities that an authority figure may be involved, I can only imagine that that did not make your parents feel any more comfortable with the situation or feel like that they may be getting because you may have you know this was off the record when we talked about it but um being an authority figure do you think that that may have lessened the likelihood that they were going to follow through with some of their questions that they think that they you know they're going to tell you right off the bat that they think an authority figure is involved do you think that they limited themselves to that i mean i don't i don't think i don't think that the fbi did but i you know i will say this i believe based on now it's 32 years, it's, it'll be 33 years this fall, this October. I, I have to say this, I believe that you know, we're dealing with the FBI and the Virginia State Police. As we talk about the other parts of the case, I'll explain why it's half and half, FBI and Virginia State Police. I believe that law enforcement has a major blind spot when it comes to participation in horrible crimes like this by other law enforcement officers. Um, I think that this is, I'm not implying that the FBI didn't look hard, they did, but I have lived this case for over three decades and then I've been in touch with, gosh, over the years now, probably hundreds of other people who have dealt with unsolved murders. There are 200,000 cold case murders in the United States. And I'm not implying that all of them are being committed by law enforcement officers, but I do believe, and the Golden State Killer case is a a great example of a case that was committed by a former law enforcement officer. And I believe that in some, in a number of examples, law enforcement has a blind spot when it comes to thinking that one of their own might be committing horrible crimes and there, there's a there's a you know the, the the thin blue line and a code of silence and all that kind of thing but any number of law enforcement agents had been mentioned as suspects in the colonial parkway murders and several of them are on what i would call the short list of of potential perpetrators so in your opinion do you feel like 
they are getting, you know, I don't want to jump ahead because we are, we're still in the first case, but with your current relationship yeah. with, with the FBI, do you feel like they're, they're putting any more effort into testing this DNA or any of the DNA that they may have? Do you feel like they're putting the resources well, in or, or do you feel like there needs to be more pressure put on them? Um, I think there needs to be more pressure put on them. Um, the pe- experts tell me they believe the Colonial Parkway murders is a solvable case, but, and I probably won't surprise anybody with what I'm about to say. I always feel that we could put more resources and have a greater sense of urgency about, uh, about the Colonial Parkway murders. And when you've been reminded over and over again, that your sister's case is a cold case and cold cases are given the lowest possible priority. Um, after a while, it borders on the offensive. You, you find yourself saying, and I've said this to the FBI directly, and they don't necessarily like this, but I've said, I don't think you're going to find anyone who's been standing in line longer than the families of the Colonial Parkway murder victims. You know, we're all at, now at 30 to 33 years we've been waiting. And I understand that terrible things happen every single day. And I understand the, the FBI in particular has been largely redeployed as an anti-terrorism agency, which has its own consequences. But it, it borders on the offensive to be told over and over again that your sister's case is a cold case and will always be given the lowest possible priority. And I do understand that we need to focus on, on new cases and terrible things that happened today or tomorrow, Mm -hmm. but I think we as a country need to find more balance and quite frankly, more resources to put into solving what I think should be a national scandal. There are 200,000 cases like ours. The Colonial Parkway murders are only eight of 200,000 unsolved cases, most of which experts tell me would be solvable with and you'll hear me say this several times in this interview, time, attention, and resources. That's all that's required. Listen to Mr. Bunker's Conspiracy Time podcast. It's a fun show about weird stuff. New episodes every Wednesday, you eggheads. I'm Art. And I'm Andy. And Mr. Bunker's Conspiracy Time is a podcast about conspiracies, the paranormal, UFOs, unsolved mysteries. We're, we're going to be discussing the Kennedy assassinations. Oh, yeah. That's his nickname, Finger Banging Bob Lazar. Give me some aliens with some good frickin' spacecraft. The whole enchilada. <laughs> the only thing bigger than Bigfoot's feet are our egos. If you like simulation theory, ancient history, egghead science, and Mandela effect, that kind of stuff. So check it out. New episodes every Wednesday. All the links you need on MrBunkersConspiracyTime.com. And we'll see you in the bunker. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. People don't always realize that physical symptoms like headaches, teeth grinding, and even digestive issues can be indicators of stress. And let's not forget about the doom scrolling, sleeping too little, sleeping too much, undereating, or overeating. I like to think that I deal with my stresses by taking a little bit of mindfulness each day. And I do try to make it a point to focus on myself because stress shows up in all kinds of ways. And in a world that's telling you to do more, sleep less, and grind all the time, here's your reminder to take care of yourself do less, and maybe try some therapy. I've personally been in therapy since I was a child, and I would suggest it for everyone. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's so much more affordable than in-person therapy. Give it a try and see if online therapy can help lower your stress. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp and Who Killed Amy Maholovic listeners. Get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash who. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash who. It's kind of like what they say about, you know, success. The 90% of it is showing up. So if they just put in... 90% of the effort 
to even just put some, just take some of the resources that you've got fighting terrorism and apply them to some of these other cases that actually affect, you know, the families that are still living here in America, you know, it would probably be a, a good idea to maybe even have a division or a department that's just focused on getting those 200,000 cold cases off the books because those are 200,000 plus families that are kind of left. I mean, the ripple effects on those are just endless. So it may be 200,000 victims, but exponentially more victims because of the fact that these cases aren't solved. And who knows yeah. what these other well, actually, cases are doing. Well, especially if you're talking about serial murders and, and, and rapists, serial murders, murderers and rapists, uh, you can actually prevent crime by stopping these people. I actually have an idea, which I'll share with you, which is when we solve the Colonial Parkway murders, note the optimism, yes. um, it's my intention to pivot to a larger discussion, which is I believe that America has a cold case problem. Um, my family's lived it for over 30 years. And by the way, there are at least two to 400,000 untested rape kits sitting on law enforcement shelves around the country. And there's definitely a tie-in between unsolved sexual assaults and serial perpetrators and sometimes transitioning over to murder. The Golden State Killer case that I mentioned is it's a killer who started as a, as, as a, a burglar, then escalated to rape, then escalated to murder. So you do see these relationships. I have an idea, which is I believe we're overspending on America's military uh, in terms of our in terms of our budget. And keep in mind, I come from a Navy family and come from military uh, background, so I'm I'm not criticizing uh, the military at all. But I think we're overspending on on America's military. I have this idea that we should, since a lot of those military personnel who are incredibly well-trained and dedicated would often transition over to law enforcement when they returned home. I have an idea, which is simplistic, but I think we should take a hundred thousand of our best and brightest military personnel who are interested in leaving the military, you know, wrapping up their service and transferring over to permanently um, budgeted uh, positions um, distributed around the country based on where they live and where these cold cases are. I think we should put a hundred thousand people on a, a, a massive project, which would cost a lot less than we're currently spending on the, on the many portions of the U.S. military to solve the two hundred thousand cold case murders and two to four hundred thousand cold case rapes. Um, and these folks would transition into permanent full-time positions in law enforcement initially focused on working these cold cases. And I've even seen a study that says that if we were to put together something like this, we'd actually save money in the long run because you'd actually be preventing additional crimes from being committed. Um, I, I don't think this is rocket science. I really don't. It's just a matter of do, do the American people have the will to put time, attention, and resources, and that means tax dollars, into um, uh, you know, solving our cold case problem. The other thing is we touched on briefly, I'm not criticizing the FBI, but the decision on 9-11 to redeploy the FBI as a largely anti-terrorism agency had consequences. And one of those consequences, I believe, is uh, the explosion in unsolved murders across the country because no one is truly coordinating our efforts to uh, solve these murders. And by the way, you know, the murderers and rapists understand this and they understand if they move from one area of jurisdiction to another, they actually stand a better chance of not being caught because American law enforcement is so fragmented and so siloed they're not coordinating particularly well. And the FBI is the agency that should be coordinating this. But since 90 cents on the dollar of the FBI's budget is going to anti-terrorism, that only leaves 10 cents in the dollar to be focused on things like, oh, the Colonial Parkway murders and other unsolved cases around the country. And with the, <clears throat> with the Colonial Parkway murders in the backyard, you would think that that would be one that they would be able to focus on at least 
you know, if they wanted to start off with something local, hey. Well, if they if they want to make us the test case, I'd be perfectly fine with that. Yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about the other parts of the case? Because yeah, I, I want to go. I want to. I want to. Yeah, to get into the detail. Just, yeah, I just I'd go go right ahead and because um, I'd love to know like what your thoughts are on the uh, you know the other victims and I mean, do you have any other thoughts on? I mean, I know you, it's like opening up a terrible wound, um, but as far as like any thoughts on you know because there's been in the other stories or other podcasts that i've listened to about this case there was a sense of like overkill do you feel like there was a sense of overkill in in your sister's death and do you feel like it was i I do i do yeah let's talk about that for a second in kathy and becky's example kathy and becky were were strangled with rope likely from behind as a matter of fact, there's even a piece of rope left under my sister's beautiful long red hair. It's sort of embedded in her neck. They were strangled with rope, and then their throats were cut from beyond ear to ear. Kathy was essentially decapitated. Um, and, and then their bodies were stuffed in uh, my sister's 1980 Honda Civic, which is, you know, that's, Hondas were pretty small back then. And so Kathy's in the, what we used to jokingly call the way back, you know, the hatchback area. Right. And she's not a small woman. You know, she's like five, seven, very athletic, 140, 145 pounds, really, a, you know, a runner athlete, uh, but she's not like five feet tall, you know? So some, they had to kind of fold her up and put her body in the back of the, of the Honda. And then Becky, whom we'd never met, but my understanding is she's a Kathy's height or maybe even a little taller, also athletic. So again, not a small person. She's in the back seat of the Honda on the diagonal. It's a two door and her feet are extending over towards the passenger door, if I'm not mistaken. And, um, and then there's this odd clumsy, my word attempt to set the car on fire using kerosene or diesel fuel. And of course that leads to a whole interesting question about this is a gas powered Honda with a manual transmission. Um, Where'd you get the diesel fuel? It, 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 yeah, who has, but who, here's one of my questions. Who has access to diesel fuel or kerosene? They're very similar, but doesn't understand the ignition properties of diesel fuel or kerosene because here's what happens. They pour diesel fuel on top of the car and inside the car and on the bodies, and then they make a repeated attempt to set the fuel on fire with matches. And there's matches and cigarettes found outside the car in a grassy area, but the car doesn't catch on fire because the ignition point of diesel fuel is not as high as gasoline. You know, we know gasoline can go up like that um, with a with a match or even a spark. You know, is where you end up with explosions and that kind of thing. Diesel fuel won't catch that way, mm-hmm. and so this person makes this attempt to set the car on fire, and then finally failing to set the car on fire, he or they, I'll just go with he for the moment, they put the car in neutral, it's a relatively small car, and they push the car over an embankment. The car is parked in a grassy pullover next to the Colonial Parkway, about 40 or so feet from the roadway. They push the car over the embankment, it rolls down a relatively steep hill towards the, the towards the surface of the York river and then gets caught in underbrush, but probably luckily from the perspective of the killer, the car is out of the line of sight from the colonial parkway, the roadway, which is nearby. So the car then gets caught in the brambles. It doesn't make it down to the surface of the water. The nose of the Honda is close, but it's hidden from the roadway. So it's kind of in this underbrush. So the national park service rangers, who patrol the parkway using standard issue cop cars. This is before SUVs. They ride by, you know, several times a day, patrolling the road, looking for people that are broken down, enforcing the law, you know, pulling people over for speeding, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, They don't see the car. So the car, they believe that the incident occurred late Thursday night. um, And the 
bodies are not found in the car until Sunday, I think afternoon by someone who is out of their car. They say passerby, um, but someone who's out of their car and closer to the edge of the water, walking or running, we think. He sees the car over the embankment and, um, and, and calls in what he thinks is a traffic accident at that point. But back to your overhill question. So in this first in- incident, we have rope, knives, and fuel used. It's, it gets a little biblical, if you think about it. Um, and there is a sense of, of overkill about the, the first murder um, with the multiple methods used. And, you know, finally, an attempt to set the car on fire, likely to to hide evidence. Now, obviously, if the car had caught on fire, I think that ultimately would have attracted attention. But um, all of this is fairly time consuming when you think about this, you know, one step, you know, the rope, then the knives, then the fire, moving the car, pushing the car over the embankment. You know, you're looking at a pretty lengthy chunk of time. So whoever killed Kathy and Becky felt comfortable enough in that environment to spend some time. Um, that makes you, uh, you know, pursuing their plan. And the sense is, is that the murder did not take place at that location, but the car may have been moved after uh, Kathy and Becky were murdered, and in when the other, as we talk about the other Parkway murders incidents, there is a strong sense of uh, moving of cars and and kind of staging of vehicles. In other words, to create certain impressions by the perpetrator or perpetrators. Yeah, that's um, you know the whole. The, the whole idea that somebody would be so comfortable to stand there lighting match after match unsuccessfully, uh, it sort of has to bring you back to that authority perspective because nobody's going to question a vehicle of authority on the side of the road, but they might question somebody right. standing there, you know, having just committed a crime it's just to me it, it's it rings of uh something was blocking the perspective of where he was doing this and again like you said he was comfortable in that environment so you just killed two people how are you comfortable in that environment still like it just doesn't it doesn't make much sense other than this the idea that that person is one very familiar with the area and two is pretty confident that nobody's going to stop and ask him what he's doing. Right. And when I did interviews out there um, on the parkway, it's got a rough surface to the road. We talked about the fact that the parkway is designed to look like an old fashioned pre interstate highway road. Mm -hmm. Um, This was designed by the park service. But you can hear the cars coming because it's got this kind of rough surface. But I, I remember when I was out there doing a series of interviews, I had time in between, and you've got lots of time to think. I actually sat there several times, and I would listen for a car coming, and then I would count the seconds before the car appeared and could see into the pull-off where I was waiting, which is where Kathy and Becky's bodies were found. And it was about 10 to 15 seconds. So, again... And in the dark, you'd probably be able to see the headlights coming. Um, That's a good point. Who's got, who's, you know, whoever they were, they were comfortable enough that they're willing to take all of these steps involving killing Kathy and Becky and the car and the whole nine yards, knowing that someone could appear within 15 seconds or so of the time they first heard them and might see the headlights coming. So, Whoever it is, they they got a lot of nerve, or they're very comfortable in that environment, and and you know that person that was coming around the curve could be a cop or a park ranger, <clears throat> and I, I don't know. It's one of those things that that sort of sticks with you. 
But there were only two cops that patrolled that area of that 23 miles. Well, stretch. but as I, as I, as, as I said, dozens of different agencies, law enforcement officers use the parkway uh, and still okay. do as a cut, as a cut through. So in other words, even if they didn't necessarily have jurisdiction, there were a lot of law enforcement people using that road and they might not have all been pulling people over or, or what have you, but almost anybody from law enforcement, if they saw something that was out of the ordinary probably would have stopped right. and, you know, intervene, intervened in some way, even to, and might've even called ahead to say that, um, you know, radio back to wherever their base was to say that, you know, you need to get a national park service ranger here. Um, cause they're the folks that had jurisdiction, uh, along the parkway. But it, it, all I'm saying is yes, if it was late at night, it does get pretty lonesome out there, but whoever is perpetrating this crime seems to feel pretty comfortable, um, with, with proceeding with whatever they're doing. Now, it, it, the FBI does feel that it's very likely that the murders did not take place at this very shallow, pretty little grassy turnout, um, but likely at one of the other more private pull-offs. There was a, there's a picnic area about a mile away, which is now closed after uh, problems with gay cruising, which again, may be related in some way, um, that is much further back from, from the parkway and would allow you a significantly more privacy. Um, so for example, one of the theories that the FBI has is it's possible that Kathy and Becky's murder took place in one of these other pull-offs that were not so close to the road. And then the car is moved after the fact. But even at the end, if Kathy and Becky were already dead, you've still got the, um, you know, pushing the car over the edge. Trying to light know, it on the fire. Final step. You're still trying to light yeah, it on fire. Yeah, which could have happened. I mean, yeah, it could, could have happened back in the woods. But it, it seems like, like more likely it happened right there at the edge of the river. Because of the fact that there were matches at the edge of the river. Right. Right. I, mean, I remember they, you know, they told us there were matches and cigarettes. Um, and we assume the, the grass area up above. They, we, I assume it, they collected that stuff, right? Oh, they did. Uh, again, uh, you know, for the benefit of your listeners, this is thirty, almost thirty-three years ago. DNA had not come out of the lab yet. True. And and crime scenes were not secured in the same way that they are now. I've talked to first responders who were there um, the day Kathy and Becky's bodies were found, who told me they climbed into the Honda. They were not initially, they were not able to um, get into the car because the two door was down the embankment and the branches and brambles were holding the door shut. So unfortunately, one of the first people on scene who was a national park service ranger smashed the back window of the Honda. He thought, remember, it was called in as a traffic accident. He thought it was possible that the two women were trapped inside the car or were injured. He didn't know he was dealing with a murder scene. So he, he I think his intentions were good, but very unfortunately, he smashed the back window, which just probably destroyed a significant amount of evidence, and then shattered the bodies with broken glass. And then later, after they pulled the car back up, from the embankment onto the level grassy area. Um, and first responders uh, went into the car to look at the bodies and they quickly realized they were dealing with a, with a crime scene here, but they were actually in the car with the bodies. So a lot of evidence from a 2019 perspective was completely compromised by the standards of what was going on in crime scenes in 1986. Yeah, I could, yeah, yeah, especially in 1986. And so basically you have investigators rummaging through a crime scene, cross-contaminating God knows what. And so really all yeah. the evidence that they collect at that time, or at least inside the Honda, you got to at least look at with a 
it, you know, a different. And it, it happened. It happened in in other in other cases as well. So, um, so in as far as her, okay, so Kathy's case that happens in October of eighty six. Correct. So another the next killing doesn't happen until a year later or almost a year later. Yeah. Yeah. So September 20th, 1987, it's almost a year. Um, David Nobling, who's 20 and Robin Edwards, who's 14. Uh, but don't be deceived by the 14. She's very much a, uh, 14 going on 24. If you're catching my drift here, they're found shot to death about, it's got to be close to 30 miles, 25 miles away at a place called the Ragged Island Wildlife Refuge. This is um, uh, on the James River. Kathy and Becky were found on the York River. Um, in, it's not far from Smithfield, Virginia, home of Smithfield ha uh, Hams. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, da David Nobling's uh, pickup truck is found at a parking area at the wildlife refuge right next to a pretty substantial bridge called the James River Bridge, which is a number of miles long and crosses the James River at a pretty wide point. It's very kind of rural and, and spread out and marshy um, at the wildlife refuge. On the other side of the bridge, which is like four and a half miles long, is the city of Newport News, and that's a place where they build uh, Navy ships and that kind of thing, big, big shipyards. But on this, on, on their side of the, uh, the river is very quiet at that time. It's more built up now. Um, the car is found parked at the, at the wildlife refuge. The bodies are found three days later in the water, um, sadly by uh, David Nobling's father, Carl, and investigators who were searching um, the Ragged, Life, Ragged Island Wildlife Refuge um, for, for evidence. They discover uh, Robin and, and David's bodies. Um, they, it appears they've been in the water for, for the three days since they had gone missing. Um, both of them had been, had been shot to death. Um, they think that David may have uh, struggled or broken away because he's, he's shot in the shoulder and then finished off with a kill shot to the head, forgive me for being graphic, and Robin is also shot in the head. Thank you again so much for listening. If you have not yet subscribed to Who Killed Amy Mihaljevic, please do. And as a reminder, this is an independently produced podcast, so if you'd like to help keep the lights on and the recorders running, you can help support the show by clicking on the donate button on the right side of whokilledamymihaljevic.com or via the Venmo app with my username at BillHuffman3. Any amount is appreciated, and as I mentioned before, it does help keep the recorders running. If you want to stay up to date on the case, you can follow me on Twitter at BillHuffman3. Anyone with information can call their local FBI branch or email it to colonial underscore parkway underscore murders at ic.fbi.gov. If you enjoy this podcast, please leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. News help keep shows like this in the spotlight and help keep cases like the Colonial Parkway murder front and center. So anyone with information about any of the cases that we have discussed in previous weeks, you can contact the FBI at 1-800-CALL-FBI. If you have any information about Holly Peranian's murder, you can reach the Hampton County State Police Detective Unit at 413-505-5993. I will also provide the email in the show notes. People are also welcome to text information to, quote, crimes, 274-637, with the subject line, quote, solve Holly Peranian, unquote. A $40,000 reward is being offered for information leading directly to the arrest and conviction of the people responsible for her death. If you have any information regarding the case of 16-year-old Molly Ann Bish, you can also contact the FBI at 1-800-CALL-FBI or the Massachusetts State Police 
at 1-800-808-9677. And don't forget, October 27th will mark 30 years Amy Mihalovic's case has remained unsolved. If you have any new information, please contact the Bay Village Police Department at 440-871-1234. The FBI is offering a reward up to $50,000 for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the individuals responsible for the death of Amy Renee Mihalovic. So stay tuned next week for part two of the Colonial Parkway murders. And in the meantime, thank you so much again for listening and be safe. Listen to Mr. Bunker's Conspiracy Time Podcast. It's a fun show about weird stuff. New episodes every Wednesday, ya eggheads. I'm Art. And I'm Andy. And Mr. Bunker's Conspiracy Time is a podcast about conspiracies, the paranormal, UFOs, unsolved mysteries. We're, we're going to be discussing the Kennedy assassinations. Oh, yeah. That's his nickname, Finger Banging Bob Lazar. Give me some aliens with some good frickin' spacecraft. The whole enchilada. <laughs> the only thing bigger than Bigfoot's feet are our egos. If you like simulation theory, ancient history, egghead science, and Mandela effect, that kind of stuff. So check it out. New episodes every Wednesday. All the links you need on MrBunkersConspiracyTime.com. And we'll see you in the bunker. Are you tired of seeing your teen or young adult struggle on a path that clearly isn't the right fit? Is your teenager confused about which direction to take after high school? The future of work is changing rapidly, and our kids need to know all of the options available after high school so they're empowered to make the choice that is best for them. In each episode, we explore the latest trends that are shaping the opportunities of today and tomorrow. I'm your host, Betsy Jewell, and this is the High School Hamster Wheel Podcast.